This video describes the technique of arthroscopic saucerization and repair of a torn discoid medial meniscus. A 23-year-old woman presented to our orthopedic clinic with knee pain mostly on the medial side. She also described a snap that was followed by tenderness of the knee and swelling. The patient reported a notable decline in her quality of life due to her symptoms. The physical exam was pertinent for mild swelling, medial joint line tenderness, as well as a palpable snap that caused severe discomfort. The McMurray test was positive, but no ligamentous laxity was noted. X-rays of the patient's knee were normal, with possible mild increase in the medial joint space. However, due to the chronicity of symptoms, we proceeded with an MRI that revealed increased meniscal body width on the coronal MRI and absence of bow tie sign on the sagittal views. These findings were suggestive of a medial discoid meniscus. The sagittal views also revealed meniscal injury extending from the posterior medial meniscocapsular junction to the mid-body of the meniscus on the periphery, suggesting an incomplete bucket handle tear. We decided to proceed with surgical intervention. The plan was to saucerize the meniscus up to a stable border and to secure it. Prior to surgery, a preoperative examination under anesthesia was performed, demonstrating range of motion at 0 to 150 degrees with an audible pop at 30 to 40 degrees. The surgical incision sites were also marked for the inside-out repair to prevent distortion of knee landmarks after fluid insufflation. Following the preoperative exam, a diagnostic knee arthroscopy was performed through the inferolateral and inferomedial portals to visualize the discoid medial meniscus. The stability of the meniscus was also assessed. As shown here, as the knee was flexed, the posterior horn of the meniscus subluxated anteriorly. This coincided with the patient's snapping sensation in her clinical presentation. Complete separation of the meniscocapsular junction was seen through the inferolateral portal. A 70-degree scope was used to view fraying likely consistent with a posterior medial tear through the notch. During the diagnostic arthroscopy, the lateral compartment was also visualized, demonstrating an intact and stable lateral meniscus. This patient was also noted to have an anomalous insertion of the anterior horn of the medial meniscus at the ACL. The decision was made intraoperatively to neglect this finding. Upon completion of the diagnostic arthroscopy, an arthroscopic punch and shaver were used to saucerize the meniscus to normal anatomic dimensions. Six to eight millimeters of stable rim was preserved. After the saucerization was complete, the stability of the meniscus was assessed once more. As shown here, the meniscus continued to subluxate anteriorly when the knee was flexed. A standard posterior medial approach for inside-out meniscal repair was performed using the previously marked incisions. Five inside-out vertical mattress sutures were placed over the posterior horn and body of the meniscus. The repair was begun posteriorly to secure the meniscus to the posterior capsule and carried on through the meniscal body. The suture needles were retrieved under direct visualization through the medial incision. After passing all the sutures through the medial incision, slight tension was applied and arthroscopic examination of the subluxating meniscus was performed to note absence of subluxation. No subluxation was appreciated and the sutures were tied over the capsule. A microfracture awl was used in the notch to induce healing. The medial incision was closed in the standard surgical fashion with 3O Vicryl for the dermal layer and 4O proline for the skin. The arthroscopic incisions were closed with 4O nylon sutures. Following wound closure, the patient was placed in a knee immobilizer locked in extension. A partial weight-bearing protocol in the immediate postoperative period was used. The patient was kept in extension for the first two weeks. Due to her previous subluxation at 30 to 40 degrees of flexion, Range of motion restrictions after this period were 0 to 40 degrees. Restrictions were increased to 0 to 90 degrees at 5 weeks. However, at 8 weeks, the patient's knee range of motion was only 60 degrees at maximum flexion. The patient underwent closed manipulation under anesthesia 9 weeks postoperatively. Range of motion improved to 0 to 135 degrees. Range of motion restrictions of 0 to 90 degrees for weight-bearing activities were kept until 4 months post-operation. Six months postoperatively, the patient's range of motion was 0 to 145 degrees compared to approximately 0 to 155 degrees in the contralateral leg, with no recurrence of popping, locking, swelling, or medial joint line pain at nine months follow-up. 